and welcome to the third episode of season three of the Education Magazine. And with me, as always, Chris McFarlane. How are you, Chris? I'm very well, Mike. How are you? I'm not too bad. I'm getting a bit irritated by the government, I've got to say. Well, not for the first time, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, the reason for that is some weeks ago I wrote to uh, the government and I asked the question, do you have a practice or policy written or otherwise, in which the DfE has encouraged its officers to direct local authorities to actively reduce the number of EHCPs a local authority might issue within its area. And the second question I asked was whether the DfE was aware that its employees, or indeed any other officers with whom it might contract, are already communicating to different local authorities across the UK in terms of them adopting a policy or practice to try and reduce the number of EHCPs. EHCPs, as for some of you would know, it's an education healthcare plan, which is similar to the IDP that exists in Wales and the old Statements of Special Educational Needs, which some of you might all remember, which is a document that is supposed to be legally guaranteeing the support that a child might need um, when they have special educational needs. And the document pretty much describes the child's needs and the provision in order to meet those needs. And so the idea is to evaluate children, um, because children, um, each child is treated differently, each child have different unique needs, and to look into those unique needs and determine what those needs uh, actually are, and then to decide what provision to make. So it seems odd that the government would be writing to, to local authorities, or even already yeah. communicating with them, and saying, look, reduce the number of the ACPs. Yeah. So I, I had an answer. Uh, and the department said, we do not have a practice or policy, written or otherwise, which encourages its officers to direct local authorities to actively reduce the number of EHCPs a local authority might issue within its area. Further, the department is not aware of any of its employees or any officers with whom it might contract, orally communicating to different local authorities in the UK, that local authorities should adopt a practice of reducing the number of EHCPs. Bingo, we thought we were all fine. Nice and easy. And I actually, i got to say, Chris, I mean, I've been doing this job for a long time, as you know, but I don't always keep up to date with what's going on in the news. No. So it was because of um, a guest that we have today, um, largely because of her, she triggered my interest because she said to me to look, asked me to go and look at the safety valve scheme, which I somehow was going on in the distance. Yeah. I didn't really know about it. Yeah. And um, But what is this safety valve scheme? So... Well, um, first, I didn't know on earth, I didn't have a clue. Yeah. And so I looked into it. And my Lord, on the Department for Education website, there are clearly examples of different contracts that the government are entering into mm. with different local authorities. One of whom they were intending to enter into a contract with was Bournemouth, Bournemouth uh, Christchurch and Poole. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that um, contract before they released or approved the contract, they haven't actually approved the contract, but before they did, uh, they were advocating ways to try and, if you like, quietly introduce a policy to significantly restrict mm -hmm. the EHCPs <clears throat> that might exist in its area. Significantly restrict. So there's a, on the one hand, to reduce, let's yeah. try and reduce the number, but also restrict the new the new. So that got me thinking, that's not, that's not good enough. <laughs> yeah. And um, it, it, it was quite surprising. So I, I managed to speak to um, a guest who is with us today, Rachel Filmer, who actually is um, set up the Bournemouth Christchurch and Poole uh, Alliance for Children and Schools. And she has been actively participating in a campaign to stop these safety valve schemes. And it's actually been uh, linking up with other uh, local authority areas, Devon, Bristol, Bracknell Forest, we know about Bracknell yep. Forest recently entered into a safety valve agreement, to try and stop it. So it's a very, it's, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Rachel. Rachel, hello, how are you? Nice to see you today. I'm well, thank you. It's lovely to see you both too. Rachel, tell me how you got involved and, uh, in the scheme and tell us about the scheme from a parent perspective, you know, from, from your perspective, what, what caused you real concern? Well, I'd seen the document that, that you just mentioned. The um, It was a plan that had gone to the local schools forum, which set out 
um, a couple of options, a short five year plan for this scheme, which they said wasn't doable, and then a longer 15 year plan, which they said was much safer and child centred. But I saw the detail of that document and, and found it really quite terrifying. Um, it involved things like halving the number of plans that would be issued every month, um, reducing the cost of post-16 provision by £4 million in a year, and then a further £1 million. Um, lots of issues with independent and non-maintained special schools. So this document was being presented at a children's services scrutiny meeting. So a few of us watched it online and were just stunned by some of the things that we heard we were so concerned and a few of us you know thought we'll set up a small group and we'll talk about it and see if there's anything that we can do and and in the end it ended up growing quite significantly so we've you know we've had protests we've had um, a petition that went to council to prevent it being signed off without a full council vote and from my perspective um, my twins they're non-verbal they're in a non-maintained specialist school and they're doing really well we did have to go to tribunal to get them there but they're doing well now um, but I've been supporting parents through the EHCP process just voluntarily for the last few years and have seen how much we're already failing to meet the needs of these children statutory duties just aren't being met already so the idea that funds could be cut so significantly and still meet children's needs was was patently not true so that's why I got involved in the first place. What do you say, though, to, about councils who are cash starved? They simply don't have the funds. I have empathy for the councils. I think they're in a, a really difficult position. Yeah. I, I genuinely do. Um, I think they're constantly being asked to try and wangle ways around the things that they need to provide. And often, you know, they'll jump from not assessing in the first place and then not issuing plans and then making plans vague and you've got this kind of circle round and round but fundamentally they they must know they're being asked to do something that will not only harm children but which is impossible so at this point i feel like it's on the local authorities really to be taking it up with the government rather than making our children suffer from your perspective um having fought a case in tribunal for your two children um did you find in that day that Bournemouth were easier to deal with? because Is that the reason why they have a, a, a high deficit? Because they were actually doing a, a better job, trying to make sure that everyone's in the, in the right setting? Not that, in my uh, experience, no. I, I don't think that's why. I think, I think what I'm seeing here and, and everywhere is over time, the gradual chipping away of the non-statutory support and services that prevented needs from escalating. So we're seeing more EHCP needs assessment applications because the support that was available before without that plan no longer exists. So I don't think it's surprising that we're seeing these giant costs and the, the need within statutory services growing because there isn't anything else. It's the only way to get help now. So I think that's why the deficit's grown so quickly. And it has. I mean, I think it's gone from four to 63 million in about three or four years. So in your experience, Rachel, um, when you're speaking with schools as part of your campaign, are they on board with this? Are they supporting you? Are they, do they say themselves, the mainstream schools, we just don't have enough money? Yes, absolutely. And I think um, recently they've, t like in many safety valve areas, they've taken a certain amount out of their dedicated schools grant away from mainstream schools to put towards the deficits. So here it's 0.5%. Um, the Department for Education had to sign off on that because schools refused. And that will take some schools below their minimum per pupil funding level. So there is no way that they can provide additional support without funding when their budgets are being cut even further. It, it's literally impossible for them to do it. And they're really concerned about it. Do you find that a typical mainstream school in Bournemouth, do they have, Bournemouth Christ Judge and Pool, do they have access to specialist, specialists in an outreach service and, and therapy teams and so on? No, not really. I think at this point, um, any support from, say, the Educational Psychology Service is all being ploughed into needs assessment, so they're not getting anything beyond that. They've got very little um, speech and language therapy, OT, they're, they're not able to access that. Um, TA numbers have dropped and will likely drop further with this funding cut too. So they're really starved for resources and now they're being asked to keep more children in mainstream 
um, as part of any plan going forward to reduce their spend. So they're in a they're in an absolutely impossible situation and they're very unhappy about it. I know there was a, a letter from four head teachers um, that went out to the press last week just saying they, they simply cannot do this. Right, yeah. No, I, I think, and I think really the problem in Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole is represented what's going on around the whole country, isn't it, Chris? Well, uh, absolutely. And I think what we're seeing here is is the, the, the government in, in Westminster reaping what it sowed, really, in the sense of, you know, we've had successive policies of cutting local authority funding from austerity through to obviously the, the more recent recession. And what you've had then is, as Rachel correctly pointed out, and as you say, Mike, is not something we're seeing just in BCP, but we're seeing around England and Wales in particular, is that those services that were available have been cut, resource bases have been closed, um, specialist teachers are not available, speech and language therapists have not been recruited, educational psychologists have not been recruited, all under the guise of saving money, saving money, saving money. But it is short-term thinking, because now we are 10 years beyond those first austerity measures. We're now seeing that the, the readily available resources are no longer there, and they are cheaper per unit. If you have an extra educational psychologist, your assessments are more efficient. You can have earlier intervention to support children. If you have more specialist teachers or specialist resource bases, then it may be that fewer children are going into the independent sector for their education because you have the resources available at the local authority level that are already, you know, you've got the economies of scale of having multiple children in one place and you're not having to pay the overheads of an independent placement as well. But because all those cuts have happened, we're now in a situation, as Rachel correctly said, where you know children are needing to get an EHCP for one, uh, but equally, they then have to go out of county, they have to go residential, or they have to go into more expensive placements yeah. because the placements are just not available in the local authority area. And, and, and this is what happens. You know, if you don't, they always say prevention is better than cure. And regrettably, we've gone past the point of cure and into the point of crisis, I think. And this is where this policy is coming from. Rachel, yeah, I mean, bringing me back in. I mean, the government, the, the local government in, in BCP, um, they were introducing, I said in my letter to the Secretary of State recently, that they're introducing the policy by stealth. You, you were not given access to the plan, were you, or the, what the management plan was. So could you tell, could you advise the, the audience about what the management plan is and what they were saying in that? So each local authority submits to the Department for Education a DSG dedicated schools grant um, deficit management plan alongside some other information, which maps out exactly how they're going to bring their overspend down and get to the point where they're no longer overspending each year. And that comes with some funding from the DFE, it comes with some budget taken from schools and some contribution from the local authorities general funds. And I don't think that in any of the 38 now agreements, the detail of those agreements are available to the public. I haven't seen a single set. And what is published by the DFE once the agreements are signed are four or five pages of very vague high level information but we don't know what any of these areas have actually agreed to do um, you can see the kind of monitoring reports that the local authorities in the agreements have to uh, submit i think it's three times a year and it tracks things like the number of ehcps the number of children in um, independent and non-maintained settings but whether those are actual targets um, what they've agreed to we we don't actually have that information and that's been part of our concern and what we do know, though, is like, for example, in York, yeah. uh, they they wrote in the document that in the contract that they did enter mm -hmm. with the department um, that we must adopt strategies to manage demand, reduce the escalation of need and to achieve a timely ceasing of education and healthcare plans. I mean, that's what York, if you like, I'm paraphrasing what was going mm -hmm. on in York. Chris, how can you reduce the escalation of need? Well, you, you realistically can't. Um, and, and this is what I think is, is so frustrating, I think, for all of us, particularly us as solicitors, is that the law is the law. Statute will always trump governmental policy. And I realise the government in Westminster, the government in Whitehall, but wherever the government is, Westminster, Whitehall, on the moon, 
law is the law. You must comply with the law. You must comply with the statutory obligations. So those thresholds for NEHCP, those definitions of special education needs, special education provision are not changing. And, and so the reality is, is that the only way that you can reduce demand is to ignore children who meet that threshold. And I think that's what the real issue is. And I think what the concern about the safety valve is, because I don't think any parent or any person would think that, well, maybe local authorities could use their budgets more effectively to manage the needs of, of disabled pupils. Of course, everyone thinks that's great. You know, we want to get our most bang for our buck. We want to support as many people as we can. But the issue at hand with this type of arrangement is that it wants budgets to fall immediately or as soon as possible. And the reality is, is the, you know, when you're talking about, as some of the agreements are, of increasing the amount of children getting adequate support in mainstream, uh, reducing, therefore, the need for people to take a special, a special school placements or independent placements, um, the increasing the, the offering of local special schools, you know, increasing their capacity and increasing the, the speed with which people, pupils are assessed and supported, the reality is that is not a quick fix. You know, we know that there is a shortage of educational psychologists around. We know there's a shortage of therapists around. And it takes years to train these people. It's a doctorate to get an educational uh, psychology qualification. It is not something that you can just put an advert up overnight and fill the placement on the Monday morning. Uh, and, and this, I think, is the issue as well, is that, you know, as you say with York statements there, reduce the escalation needs adopting strategies to manage demand, what we will take what we have seen, and I think we've seen it for years, is is what I like to call the war of attrition strategy that local authorities sometimes adopt. And I remember this precisely with a case I had years ago when I mm. first started practicing. Yeah. Um, it was the case with Hampshire, actually, where uh, the child was in a specialist dyslexia school. Uh, it was accepted he had dyslexia and required specialist teaching. But what you had was, you know, parents were luckily in a position to self-fund that. Um, they got the assessments, realised you need that support, so went, right, we're not going to wait for the local authority, we're going to send him there, then we're going to go to the local authority and say, hey, you, you actually should be funding this. So they, they went for an assessment, local authority declined an assessment. Did, said, oh, we don't even, there's not even a chance that he needs special educational provision, even though they already had an educational psychology report <laughs> saying exactly that. And then we go, you know, uh, a few months into the appeal, appeals weren't quite as long as they were now, so maybe about four or five months into the appeal, evidence deadline passes, miraculously, Mike, shock of shocks, they conceded at the evidence deadline. Yeah. I mean, what a surprise. Then it was, okay. Do you think now, that's what's happening? Well, that they, most, they, what's yeah. worse is they then went on to assess. Yeah. Then said, oh, he doesn't need an EHCP. Yeah. Then it was the same thing, go through appeal, after the deadline, concede, and then finally we went for the appeal then to get the school, went all the way to the evidence deadline, after the evidence deadline, concede. So, Essentially, they took 18 months or so to do what should have taken a 20-week period in a quarter statute time frame, and they used that strategy to essentially avoid 18 months' worth of, of the fees. And to totally wear down the parent. Exactly, and to wear down the parent. And obviously, in that case, you know, the clients were in a privileged position financially, where for them, they were frustrated, of course, to pay the, the money, but they could afford to. For those parents who don't have the finances, either to pay the legal fees or, or the emotional kind of capacity to take a case forward across multiple appeals when it's self-evident from the evidence from day one what the child needs. And again, that's how you do this reduce the escalation of needs. Wear out parents. You drag it out <laughs> as long as you can uh, with the hope that, okay, maybe you know a small percentage of parents will instruct solicitors and escalate through tribunal, judicial review or yeah. otherwise, but there will be many, many parents with just as needy children who either because they can't afford it, because they don't know their rights, or simply because they just don't have the emotional capacity. You know, they're so they're so busy supporting their children that they just don't take it forward. And that's 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 unlawful. There's no other way to say it. Rachel, one of the things that the government are saying um, is just to be devil's advocate to try and understand it from the government's perspective for for the moment to see how your your reaction might be. Their position is that. If we improve and add funds to make more funds available to the mainstream sector, what's wrong with that? If we make that mainstream provision work better, why is that wrong? I don't think that is necessarily wrong. I think you'll always have children who do need a specialist setting where mainstream's never going to be appropriate because they, you know, they won't have a peer group. They can't access learning with anyone in the class. If you're being entirely educated and 
spend all of your time separately, you shouldn't be in a mainstream school, in my opinion. Um, I think there are a lot of children who could thrive in mainstream with the right support. But if you look at secondary school in particular, there's such a gulf between primary and secondary and what's required of children and what they're meant to be able to cope with. I, th I think it would require an almost complete overhaul of how secondary education works in this country to expect some of these children to be able to cope in a mainstream setting. So I think there, I think there is lots that could be done to improve um, offering within mainstream and keep more children there where it's the right thing for them, but it's never going to be the full solution and it would require significant investment. And obviously that's not forthcoming. And it's not going to stop bullying, the environmental, no. it's not going to change the environment, it's not going to reduce the class sizes because the demand for schools is still going to be there. Just some, so many children just can't cope with that kind of environment, can they? Mm -hmm. So the idea really to put more funds into mainstream school is a good one, save that it's not going to help all yep. of the children. It's not going to necessarily represent and provide support for all of the children's needs. Mm -hmm. I mean, are you finding, Rachel, in your area that parents, as to use Chris's example, uh, parents are getting more and more exhausted because they see all these different hurdles that they feel that they can't possibly conceivably cross? Absolutely. And it's definitely worsened over the last few years, not just here nationally, I'm sure. I think, you know, we had a month here a, a, a few months ago where 65% of EHC needs assessment requests were declined. Um, it's, you know, huge numbers. And if you think that at the moment a hearing date takes a year um, for, you know, a contents appeal, and we've got, I've still got some families who requested an assessment and it was agreed to assess back in June or July last year. They still haven't seen an educational psychologist now, whilst newer applications are being seen quickly because that, you know, improves your statistics on paper and makes it look like you're improving. But actually, the backlog is, is not being dealt with as it should be. So, we're, you know, we're talking years and years at the moment. I, you know, I'm speaking to families all the time who've been waiting four or five years for the help that they need often their children are not in school at all you know we're talking about attendance in the news all the time but it they're not being supported to be there and the help that they should be getting is just not not to be found it's really bad at the moment yeah really. and, and what about councils who are not play, playing ball with the government and when they enter this contract I think you know prior to coming on air today you mentioned uh, the information in the news about five different councils tell us about that so five of the agreements have been suspended because local authorities haven't met the targets that they agreed to, whatever those are, we don't know exactly. Um, so I think it's something like 17 million out of 22 million agreed for these councils has been withheld at this point. So obviously the big selling point for Safety Valve is if you cut your funding enough, we'll give you some money, not very much money and not what you need, but still some. And at this point, it's looking increasingly unlikely that that funding will actually be realised at all. And I think there have been a further two councils as well who um, their agreements have been extended by two years to try and get them over the finish line. I think anyone looking at the information that was available shows that these plans are, you know, optimistic is is an optimistic word for it. They're, yeah, they're yeah. In, impossible, I think. And, and I think, you're, Rachel, you're linked up with Devon, aren't you? I know Devon are... Tell us about what you know about what's happening in Devon. So the um, higher needs deficit in BCP is 63 million. In Devon, it's over 140 million pounds. So that's how much debt they've accumulated in funding their SEND support. And we know that they've had an inadequate um, Ofsted rating. So it's not like that's because they're doing amazingly well. That's just the situation they're in now. Um, the safety valve agreement for Devon expect them to to not be overspending within three years and at the moment they're overspending by 40 million pounds per year so that's the scale of what they're being expected to achieve in such a short time frame anyone with any sense can see you can't do that and meet your statutory duties it's it's physically not possible to do that so whether devon will ever see any of that funding is another matter uh, norfolk they went off you know they started failing to meet their targets within six months of signing their deal well, I mean, extraordinarily, I mean, I notice also for those like you, Rachel, who are in the sort of the, the, the non-maintained sector um, and independent school sector, we're seeing councils like um, Salford, uh, Southwark. These are saying, I mean, quote, in Salford, 
we, we must perform a deep dive on all placements in independent and non-maintained schools to identify children and young people to return to local provision as part of a pathway to EHCP cessation so that we must accelerate movement out of the SEND system or, or Somerset, standardise the support available for children and young people to reduce costly bespoke package. So we, we see a trend whereby if you are in the independent sector, just like you, Rachel, you must be worried about how long it will be before the council's policy eventually catches up to you and you see some changes then on the horizon for you. That, that's a real worry for you. It definitely is. I mean, we went to tribunal not because we wanted an independent setting. Our choice of school was a maintained specialist school. They had no spaces. Um, that's that's what we wanted. We we didn't get it. The local authority wanted to name a different maintained specialist school, which was for uh, profound and multiple learning disabilities. But my children don't have diagnosed learning disabilities, so it seems that wouldn't be appropriate. Um, they've been in there. Uh, it's a non-maintained school, so it's not for profits run by a charity. And they have been there three years and they're doing incredibly well. They absolutely love going to school every day more than any child I've ever seen. If they are moved purely financially, it's not their fault that a space wasn't available in a maintained school. They, they can't help that. It would be absolutely wrong to move them from somewhere where they're doing well. But I am expecting that battle at some point, to be honest. And yours, as, as, long as, as, as well as many others absolutely. around the country. I mean, I've I got to say, I'm really worried. Rachel, what do you say next for, for you? What's the next step? Well, I think... We're still at risk here in BCP locally. I think there's a good chance that we may end up back in safety valve negotiations come, you know, after the invitations for the next round come out in July. Um, from speaking to the other areas that have just signed up and seeing what's happening in these ones that are having their funds suspended, I think we need to be trying to stop this programme nationally. I think that's where we need to be focusing. It's not working. Children are being failed and they're not even realising the funds. It's it's I, I think it's embarrassing um, how badly this has gone. And I think it needs we need to put a stop to it completely. Rachel, thank you very much for joining us today. I mean, Chris, this really is an extraordinary thing. I, I agree in, entirely, Mike. So for our viewers who wish to learn more about the safety valve, uh, agreements and of course look for ones in their area. In the description below we'll link to the Department for Education website which will give a list of all the agreements that are entered and you can search for your local authority or neighbouring local authorities to find out more. But one thing I would say Michael, and you know this as well as anyone, is that when we look at the, the first tier tribunal uh, statistics, you know, local authorities are losing more than 90% of the cases. And that doesn't show that, I mean, as much as I'd like, uh, both of us would like to take credit for those statistics. The reality is, is, is not because of, you know, great lawyers or lawyers tricks. No, it's simply the degree of non-compliance at the local authority oh, yeah. level. And what the frustrating thing is, is that rather than see those issues and think, right, the issue we have is you know, much like Rachel's example there is that we haven't had the provision locally, so people have had to go into more expensive, you know, sectors such as the independent sector to find this provision right. What we need is a long-term strategy to build that provision up locally so we don't have to do that, so it's a better system overall. They're saying, no, let's just neglect more and more children and young people, um, you know, to, to, to make ends meet, and that's simply unacceptable. And, and my message to all of our viewers who are parents themselves or other loved ones of children with, with special educational needs is that the law is not changing, certainly not at the moment. And any decision by a local authority on an individual basis, safety valve or otherwise, must comply with the law. The safety valve will never trump the law. So, you know, you have a case to fight. You know, if, But if the problem with it, Chris, specials, practically, you, you have a... You, you have many tricks a local authority might practically introduce to make the alternative to the parents' preference to seem to, yeah. you know, to, to, seem to, to, to the tribunal viable. And with those, that kind of vigour behind that sort of quest, they can, parents are going to have a harder time, aren't they? 
Well, I think I think it's a twofold issue, Mike. I think certainly uh, you could see those. It's tricky because I do think that the tribunal is very good at scrutinising local authority cases. And I think the reason why we're getting those drastic statistics now is because local authorities are, as you say, making it sound like a great package, but that analysis falls down under scrutiny. If local authorities genuinely were looking to improve these plans, if actually they're saying, you know what, actually, you know, like in Rachel's case, maybe we should look at increasing capacity at that excellent school in our area, you know, to, to make sure that we can spread that support to other pupils and make it more successful, then I'm all for it. You know, I think that the, the only way to really beat an SEN appeal is to make sure that the package you're offering is adequate. So to local authority uh, workers who may be working, if you want to improve your offering to make your offer lawful, be my guest. I think that's what everybody really wants. Uh, what we don't want is rather than actually getting to the brass tacks of providing better support, you, as, as you correctly put it, Mike, offer tricks, offer a varnish on, an, ina in, on an inadequate illusions. package to try and make it look uh, like it's suitable. Because the reality is we will scrutinise it, the tribunal will scrutinise it, and, and as they are already, they will fall foul. But, you know, I fear not so much for the parents who... Well, I, I do fear, but, I mean, but not as much for the parents who have the resources and wherewithal to go to the tribunal. But we're going to see so many children falling off the cliff, particularly... I agree in areas where people haven't got that fun, those funds. It, it is awful. It is awful. And, of course, in more rural areas as well, where they don't have the economies of scale or the, or, or the resources to develop you know, special schools, or maybe if they had one centralised special school, it would be too far away from mm. others, you know, again, living more rurally to, to attend uh, regularly. It, it, there are many, many, many challenges. And, again, I think it's, it comes down to long-standing systemic failure on the part of the government to properly fund this sector for so long that we are now in a situation of crisis. You see, what we got now, I mean, we, we, as Rachel was saying, different local authorities are all pretty much following the same mm. the same uh, pathway. You know, spend less to get more money. Yes, uh, yeah. What, <laughs> I mean, I find it's just it, it, it is holding them to ransom. There it is, is no is. other way of putting and, it. And, I mean, and you see in Bexley, for example, the Bexley Council contracted to remove at least 16 learners per year out of the independent sector. Yeah. I mean, they've just picked up a figure, 16 yeah. learners a year. It, it, it's arbitrary, 16 yeah. children yeah. whose lives are going to be shattered by that. Yeah, yeah. Moving, it, changing, transition yeah. is very difficult. So many children. Yeah. And it's the phrasing of the stat as well, isn't it? It's, we're removing 16 pupils a year. It's not, right, we will, we've, we've assessed 16 learners whom, whose needs we could meet at the local level, and we're going to ensure that our packages are enhanced to entice them back over, or some, some language along that basis. No, no, it's just we're going to arbitrarily just cut them. And, and, and that, to me, is just unconscionable. It's unlawful, very clearly, but it, it, it's absolutely unconscionable. And Parliament has passed laws that are supposed to be complied with. So what do we say about um, a government, an executive, that is actually promoting a policy that is designed to try and bypass the statutory regime? Well, I, I think we tend to avoid talking politics here, Mike, as you know. It's not politics. No, no, my point is we tend not to. But I think that the truth is, is that this government is inadequate. There is no other way to put it. Its policies, and this policy in particular, just show that it is it's a, it, it has no clue what to properly do. And I think, again... Do we think it's going to change? Well, I, well, I mean, look at, look at what's happening in Wales. Well, it's That's not, a Labour administration. It, it's true. I mean, I, I think... You cannot are, get worse than what's happening in Wales. Well, I, I think they're equally bad. I think everywhere's bad at the moment. Well, I don't. I, I mean, it's, a, it's for another story, of I suppose. Course. But in Wales, we don't even have the kind of level of prescription that you have in an EACP, in an IDP, for example. Well, I think that's a, to do with the legislative change, exactly. but as you say, for a different point. But in, 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 well, quite right. And this is, this is a, it's across the spectrum, because again, whatever happens in the general election this year, the question then becomes, will any government, whichever government exactly. gets in, that's my point. Over, overturn these policies? But, but it must. And I also think, again, this policy is as well another demonstration of short-term thinking. I've talked at the very outset of this about the short-term thinking of austerity, then, of course, yeah. there, was Bre uh, there was Brexit, there was COVID. Now, of course, the, the current recession that we're in, and it's been cut, 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 cut. Well, the issue at hand is, OK, let's say you do cut resources, these learners. Let's say these 16 pupils who are 
you know, doing well in this independent sector. You know, Rachel's children are thriving in a non-maintained special school. Okay, let's say you they come into the cull and you bring them into a placement now, or you arbitrarily cut them. You unravel if, all the benefits. Well, if if that if they still don't make progress, you're then making them more reliant on the state into adulthood because their independence isn't growing. Their skills aren't developing. If we want to develop children and young people to have the relevant skills to enter the workforce to live meaningful lives of uh, to the greatest degree of independence that that child or young person can then the reality is investment at this level at the educational level is essential and the more we cut now you know because you know we talk about you know naught 25 which is technically where the the uh, children and families act has its domain being a long time well the reality is with people you know living to 80 90 and, and it will be soon more i'm sure the reality is you live a lot longer past 25 than you do before 25, or hopefully so for, for most of us. So the reality is, is that, you know, saving pennies now um, oh, without totally giving great. adequate totally compensation great. or adequate support means that you're then supporting for the next 75 years, yes, it's you know, at, at a much more expensive rate. It, it's a total false economy. And, it, it, you know, whichever government comes in. You know, they really need to, to grasp the nettle with this and other public sources as well. Like, we haven't got time to go into social care, but that's also grossly inadequately funded. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Rachel. I mean, I, thank you to everyone watching. I mean, I've got to say that there's a little glimmer of hope. Uh, I'm, I've written to the Secretary of State, uh, and I, you know, I know on Facebook, for example, I was, um, I was told that perhaps I was being too negative when I promoted this safety valve scheme and some people said, why oh, shouldn't you be talking more positive about things? Um, and yes, I'd really like to talk positive, but I think I also will still have to show you and demonstrate that things are going wrong. And that's my duty, in my opinion. And I must tell you where things are going wrong. And in my opinion, this safety valve scheme is probably one of the most dangerous schemes that I've seen introduced in my practice career, where the government are trying to sweep all these children's needs under the carpet. Um, I... I've written to the Secretary of State. I've asked them to be candid in their in in its in the in the response. I've had a response from the um, from the Secretary of State uh, Department uh, came through actually yesterday. So I'm just going to tell you what it says. Um, my letter highlighted, just so you all know, um, these examples across the different um, regions. We I, I, I highlighted the Bournemouth Christchurch and Pool. I've highlighted York's um, scheme, Haringey, Southwark's, Salford's, Bexley's, uh, Devon's, uh, and I've demonstrated that how I, I, I put across the argument: how can you really get away with this when the law is, is supposed to um, require governments to look? at individual needs and provide bespoke provision for those individual needs. How can you apply a policy that's going to create such injustice for so many? And I've asked the, the, the Secretary of State to be candid in the reply um, to, the, to the questions that I put. Does the government admit that encouraging councils who wish to access the safety valve scheme is seeking to impose restrictions on councils to reduce the number of children in its areas, irrespective of their near, need? On what basis does the government say that that is uh, that's lawful? to actually provide additional funding contingent upon, contingent upon the council spending less? Uh, how does the government propose that councils through policy can lawfully reduce demand for special educational needs? And does it accept that need does not change at a predetermined date? How can the council manage demand or reduce need other than by approach that disregards the reality of the, of the children's actual need? Uh, and please identify the councils with whom you are seeking to negotiate. Now, we know some of them. The reply I had was, you. I'm paraphrasing now, you have raised a large number of issues that we will now need to look at very carefully and respond fully in due course. So, there we have it. So, if you are a politician uh, sitting today on the terrace drinking tea and enjoying uh, the uh, spring sunshine, uh, may I just ask you to thank the Lord that you are there where you are. You're able to converse with people. You're able to sit there. You're able to make changes. You have the education to be able to do it, the wherewithal to do it. Please give some, th some thought to the children who are not there, who need your help, because they need the law to protect them. And as a parliamentarian, you should be advocating compliance with the law rather than defiance. Thank you very much for everyone watching. See you again at the next Education Magazine.